So, um, looking at, we're at about the 30 minute mark, so maybe we can talk for, um, there are two questions that I think are really relevant. Um, and the first one is the, the question that um, Susan had sent about what your position is on curation and the concerns about degradation. And I think it's really relevant to your particular piece because it is in many respects an archival piece. And so um, I guess the question of like, maybe your, your thoughts on curating digital texts in, in general, but also um, how you've been thinking about, or if you've been thinking about the ways in which what you've created will be kept alive or accessible as an actual archive, especially as <coughs> technology evolves. Yeah, well, I think, so already, like, there are things that I would change if I could go back, and maybe I'll ask if I can go back and uh, change out. For example, the the video that's embedded in, um, in the website is Flash-based, and so you can't look at it on an iPad. And, of course, I did not anticipate that at the time, and there's no reason that it needs to be in Flash, so it would be, be an easy fix to go in and say, okay, here, let's put another... Uh, you know, format in there in MP4 or whatever. But I think, um, you know, the question of also once, so it's kind of an interesting thing because I have um, certain, you know, anything that's up on my website that I have access to, I would just go in and have changed that already, right? But this idea of the way that it functions as part of this publication where, you know, although it has this kind of fluid, uh, continuous um, access and, and it's... Um, you know, it's on the web and it's just there and open for people. It also, it's open uh, to look at, but not open to go back and, I mean, I'm sure I could request to go back and change something, right? But like, I would feel like I was putting someone out, but there are things I'm just like, oh, I've learned so much about like, well, first of all, so it's funny, every time I look at the, the Olive Project on a larger screen than the one, so I composed it on a 13-inch uh, MacBook Pro and all of the, like, it is built around that screen size in a way that, like, I ha I wasn't thinking. It was the first website I ever made. I wasn't thinking about, you know, different devices and different sizes of screens and all of this. But um, it drives me crazy every time I look at it and I see that line along the, the wallpaper. I'm like, that would have been so easy for me to crop it the wallpaper uh, image at a, at a place where it wasn't, you know. <laughs> but, like, the things I designed it for a particular screen with a particular... <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, I designed it with a particular screen in mind and um, because that's what I had in front of me in the moment and so I think that's like a kind of metaphor for you know the larger things that you you don't anticipate right and and, and so um, and and it works best I think on a 13 inch screen because then you only have access to a certain number of the um, the links that can lead you to different options through uh, different uh, pieces of the of the story so if you look at it on a big like you know whatever, 21 inch um, iMac, like you have so many options of clicking all of these different things that some of the constraints that are built that are built into it kind of go away. And so there are all these things that, you know, of course, I didn't anticipate at the time. And part of that was just that I was an amateur, you know, trying to figure out what I was doing. But um, it's also I mean, I think that's one of the things that makes this kind of work exciting in a way is like the the, the inability to anticipate where it goes, you know, and, and I mean, honestly, my inability to anticipate that this project that I was doing kind of as a passion project and a class project then has had all of these different lives, you know, and I get emails from people or I see someone at a conference and, oh, you know, we love the Olive Project and I use it in my class. And, you know, it's really interesting for me just to think about, you know, I mean, I wonder what my grandma would think because she was just like, I mean, she, of course, she let me do it and she, she looked at it. You know, I had a version of it pr uh, finished before she died and you know she thought it was really interesting but she you know I don't think she would have had any idea that like college classrooms of students would be <laughs> would be looking at this thing and, and thinking her life is interesting or you know um, talk, hearing her talk about nursery rhymes in in her one-room schoolhouse and so anyway um, I'm now getting off the topic but um, but I think so for questions of curation um, and and uh, the degradation of digital text. I think uh, one of the things that is interesting to me is, um, let's see, so so oral history um, is of course as a field 
dealing with this quite a lot and, um, you know, whether or not to digitize um, old uh, cassette tapes or, or um, reel-to-reel um, audio um, <clears throat> magnetic tape, uh, whether to digitize that and make it part of the collections and what is the role of the digital in sort of preservation in that sense because, you know, in some ways we have this uh, kind of absurdist view of, of the digital being the, the answer to that. But really what it does, I think, is is provide access rather than um, any kind of security against loss. And so I think when we think about archives from a perspective of access, um, the thing that I guess is most important to me is um, I, it, I care more that people are able to look at it now <laughs> and enjoy it than um, than whether or not it will be there forever. You know, I think um, I think we have a tendency to, and there's this tendency toward accumulation, for example, in oral history. It's like we need to collect these forgotten stories and they're going to be lost if we don't collect them. But then we collect and we collect and we collect, but what do we do with them? You know, then we, there's this um, proliferation of these amazing materials that then, you know, you, what do you even what do you even do with them? And so I guess I think I'm interested in this project as um, an example of a piece that is oriented more toward access than toward preservation and saying, you know, I had this, I had this oral history interview, which I could have kept and saved. And, you know, I do have a copy of it kept and saved on in a few places and for my family to pass down to my family. Um, and that could have been the primary interest, or I could find ways of you know, repurposing that history and, and um, using it to compose something that people, um, that connects with people and that people have access to. And um, I guess that's where more where my um, heart lies. I, I do, I'm aware that there will be a time when, um, and I'm actually, in some ways, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already when, <laughs> you know, the Olive Project is, is not no longer accessible in its current state and, you know, the question of whether or not to repurpose it and, and try to adapt to the new moment <laughs> or to say it lived its life and served its purpose and I can happily know that it was there, um, I think is, is something I, I guess what I would be left with in that question. So. Awesome. Then I think maybe the last question is just asking what you're working on now and if there are any connections back to the Olive Project, or if you think that you kind of put it on a different trajectory since? Well, I think, so the Olive Project was definitely really instrumental in all of the work I've done since, I guess, and um, uh, part of, so from there, like the Olive Project was principally concerned with um, representing stories and, and thinking about storytelling and thinking about voice recordings from the perspective of uh, the content that they hold, I guess, and um, and from there I started, it kind of set me off on this path where immediately after the Olive Project I started working on some experiments where I was taking um, both of, so both of my grandparents had died at that time and I, I was taking their voice recordings and kind of creating these imagined conversations between them and trying to think like, it basically it made me start thinking about the flexibility of this audio and the potential of the audio to actually do exactly what I was working against in the Olive Project. So the possi you know, the idea that the Olive Project was motivated by this fear of kind of getting the story wrong or misrepresenting something or, you know, using it in ways that were not um, true to the intentions of the original interview, these kinds of things. Um, and then I actually took up that, that, dilemma and took it as, a, instead of think, seeing it just as a liability, kind of thinking of it as an opportunity to imagine, so what does that make possible and what can you do from there? And so um, a project that, I'm, that I've worked on and that I'm currently reworking for a different format is uh, where I'm, I've taken oral history interviews with people who have died. So in this one, I've actually taken my grandfather's interview because um, I figured it was something I hadn't I hadn't used yet. And then another interview from an online archive and uh, kind of dramatically repurposed the interviews to imagine both of, of those people, reimagine their recordings as um, 
basically remake them as characters in a fictional audio drama where they are a married couple who are in marital therapy and I am their marital counselor and it's this elaborate um, this elaborate drama that um, is drawing from the vocal materials of um, and the the recordings of these oral history interviews but then dramatically repurposing them for to do something other than which that the thing that they were intended for and thinking through the ethics of that and what kinds of both, you know, ethical questions and also ethical possibilities that that um, provides. So that was one direction it took. And then I've also, another thing I'm working on right now um, that's more immediately connected to the Olive Project is, um, so there's one one story that is embedded in the maze of <laughs> the Olive Project that is um, uh, something that, about my grandmother's uh, baby sister and um, it was a story that I was very interested in and very compelled by and also very scared of for a really long time. And so um, this, uh, I've kind of brought myself to the point where I could um, start thinking about like, what would it mean to actually try to tell a story rather than to avoid telling a story with these materials and how would I approach that? And and uh, this is a project that, you know, I, I enlisted my dad and we went up to Minnesota and found the site of my uh, grandmother's, my so my great-great-grandfather's um, farm that my grandma grew up on and, you know, was doing some documentary kind of photograph projects and then working with archives, like other kinds of archives, photographic archives and, and some documents and things to kind of try to think about how to recompose the story in a way that responds to the gaps that are there in the archive, but also thinks about how the materials themselves can be used as um, a kind of uh, impetus for the story and, and what kind of ethical, um, or how to address the ethical uh, questions that come up around um, kind of unearthing things that are that are complicated and emotionally and uh, for my family, et cetera. So, so that's been actually really fun and also really scary because it, it's kind of, I'm not able to hide behind the, you know, let's just <laughs> make this a participatory thing where everyone can, you know, like I'm farming out the ethics to, uh, and, the, and the responsibility to the audience. You know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to think about what it means to take that on and, and um, how to work through it in a constructive way. So that's like a really awesome place to end, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And, and audience and yeah thank you so much yeah thank you um, this is great and um I guess what <coughs> I do is um I'll I'll write David and ask um if he has like a link to the 